Hello, everyone, and welcome to Writers Drinking Coffee. This is a podcast with a bunch of writers who sit around, drink, and talk about writing, publishing, and the whole creative process. We do not censor ourselves, so consider us PG-13. Today, your hosts are Chaz Brenchley, John Schmidt, and me, Jeannie Warner. This is episode 96, Biographical Stories with Carol Wolf. Welcome back again, Carol. We love having you here. Hi, thank you so much. I'm glad you thought to bring me back. Well, this started, I think, because, uh, John, you were watching her movie, of storytelling of biographies, were you not? Uh, no, I saw that she had the movie, and then I saw that she has two movies, and then I, it, it just snowballed, and I looked at it, and it got more and more interesting. I haven't actually watched the movie yet. I've read a bunch of reviews of it, but I wanted to ask her, uh, is this related to the book that was written about it? Is it something she wrote? How did she pick the people? Uh, it, it, and Carol, you're such an amazing resource in both film and writing. Anything you say is going to be interesting. So tell us about this movie that you're having that is showing at various... Oh, rain. It's being shown at the Poppy Jasper International Film Festival. It was supposed to be shown last year at the 15th annual International Poppy Jasper Film Festival. And then, of course, COVID. And we were all excited because, you know, there were going to be parties, but they wrote me in December and they said, well, we're going to do the, we're going to do the whole thing online now this year. And they're going to, I guess they're doing two at once because this one's going to be longer. So this is the Poppy Jasper International Film Festival number 15 and 16. And my movie is Letters to My Grandchildren. And it's a documentary feature, which came about when my mom was diagnosed with terminal cancer. My My grandmother died when I was 17, the year I was 17. And it was the first person I ever lost who meant, well, she was the first person I ever lost. And she meant a whole lot to me. And within six months, I realized I had lost the sound of her voice. I remembered, you know, so much about her, but I'd lost the sound of her voice. So when my mom was diagnosed with terminal cancer, the first thing I thought was, I'm not losing the sound of her voice. And then I thought, all of her grandchildren are under 12. I think she had an 11 year old, a nine year old and a seven year old. And I thought they're not going to remember her. And my mom was one of the wisest people I've ever met. She ended up being a therapist in sand play therapy, but she also had a degree in from an uncredited university in new age, new age psychology. So she was into everything all the time. And then a year later, she'd be into everything else. Wait, did she have a degree from an institute in Palo Alto? No, I'm not. Sh- she was down in San Diego. I'm not sure where she okay. was doing it, but she got a, She had a master's degree in early childhood education and a master's degree in psychology and studied with the last living disciple of Jung to learn to do sand play therapy, which she did down in San Diego for many years. And uh, then she got another master's degree from an uncredited university. I interviewed her for all of the advice that she would give her grandchildren growing up about school and about relationships and about marriage and about and she said the most astounding things and I've been listening to her all my life so I thought wow I should ask other people this and she'd come up to my place with her best friend so I sat her best friend down and I interviewed her for all the things she would tell her grandchildren and got another amazing interview and so I, I went to my executive producer, uh, William Jurish, the executive producer of Pop Art Studios, who had produced two other films that I did. And he greenlighted this. And I collected interviews for years and then spent as many years editing it because when you have a bunch of people talking to make it you know, compelling, to give it a tension level, to give it a story arc, to make it so that you don't look away was a lot of work. And I learned a lot. So I thought it was going to be a short film, but it came in and ended up coming in at 93 minutes. And I'm really proud of it. it. When we sent it on the film festival circuit, it got, it was first screened at the Great Lakes International Film Festival. And then it was at Miami Independent. And then it got into Poppy Jasper, which I'm very proud of. So that is Letters to My Grandchildren. So when you, when you started recording your mother... Were you doing this on video or just sound? We founded a micro-budget film company in 2005, and we made two feature films. Right. So we had we had a Canon XL2 yeah. camera. So no, it was it was no, it was a it was done on our Canon XL2. 
So your production company already had some of the necessary equipment. We had all the necessary equipment. We'd already we'd already put two films online. We already had two feature okay. films. Needed. So you expected it to be shorter, but you kept finding better and better material. Did you spend more time finding material, or is it really that editing process, which I have to say right now is a huge mystery to me, that took you the time? It was both, because by the time I finished, I had what, 20 some odd hours of people talking. And to get that down into a film, I had to figure out how to edit, how to edit that, and then how to edit together. What I figured out I wanted is that I have the grandparents talking about their grandchildren. And then what I decided I wanted was I wanted still pictures of the grandchildren as a contrast, you know, the still children frozen in time while the grandparents are still talking. (laughs) That would be a beautiful thing. Do you know how hard it is to get someone to give you a photograph of their grandchildren for popular consumption? It is not like pulling teeth. It is like pulling their lungs out through their throat. (laughs) That's interesting. I I, I would have almost thought the opposite. It's like, show me your grandchild picture. I thought it was one of those, you know, they just want to whip out. Yeah, but show it to everyone on the planet. That took a long time. And I suppose I figured out what I should have done. But the thing is, this has been a an organic process. I mean, it started with, I can't lose my mom, who I was losing. And then it became, oh my God, this material is just astonishing. People say, when you point a camera at someone and say, what do you think needs to be preserved? What do people need to know that you know? They say the most amazing things. They say amazing things. And that's what my, my film is full of. So what I should have done from the beginning, which I didn't know because it grew, was if you're going to be in my movie, you have to give me a picture of your grandchild and (laughs) sign this contract saying I can use it because, you know, that's part of it. You have to have the right to use it. That was um, a stumbling block to some of the to, to the time it took to edit. And then there was the music, which, you know, you have to own everything that's in your project. This was the lowest of all low, low budget films. So I ended up writing the music, too, which then made it take longer. So I didn't know you did music as well. She's very talented. Clearly. Well, it's it's that ownership thing. I wrote a musical when I was in grad school. And by <laughs> then I had been taught, you do not want to give ownership of your project to somebody else. So I wrote my yeah. own songs. I wrote the songs for terrible, The Terrible Experiment of Jonathan Fish. And yeah. I had been lucky enough to be forced by my mother, that same mother, to take 10 years of piano lessons from a woman who also thought that if you knew piano, you needed to know theory. So I learned both piano and theory and was able to write melodies and also sco- and also write harmonies to them. So yeah. It is a useful talent. I think all children should be abused in this manner. I think all children should be forced to take music. <laughs> well, they should because they've definitely proven that it builds neurons that cross left brain to right brain the more that you sing, especially if you play an instrument, because that combination of moving your fingers, reading the music, listening blowing it uses every sense you have plus if you're actually trying to play with somebody then you have to go along somebody and match their tempo or worse at conductors i I had thought of it that way but yeah absolutely it's very useful did any of the grandparents recommend it as well no as a matter of fact you must ply your mu let him ply his music yes I think you should do it in the next one, although my next question is only tangentially related. What, where, when should I look to see a production of this terrible experiment of Mr. Oh, Fish? terrible experiment? Well, I am in negotiation with a producer in the hopes that we can put it up a year from this summer because I want to take it to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. I think the terrible experiment of Jonathan Fish, a musical extravaganza from which most of the music has been canceled, um, would rock the fringe. And I've always thought so. And uh, what I needed was a production in order to make that happen. So I am, we are in discussions about it, but I, I want to take it to the fringe. We're going to have to relink that because the fringe for people who may not have tuned into last time sounds like the most amazing festival I've ever been to in my life. So it is. Sum it up in four sentences, guys. <laughs> you will be changed. It is 1,200 plays a day for three weeks from all over the world. And they are not 
nobody gets to say who gets to come. So everybody just invites themselves. So they are everything from the worst theater you ever saw to the most stunning theater you ever saw that you will never forget. And they are scheduled in five minute intervals from nine in the morning till one in the morning. And if you are a theater person, it is paradise. Yes. And it is essential, really. Um, the, I mean, it's the whole city of Edinburgh. They are everywhere. Every, every church hall, every theatre, any performing space that's available. Is Basements, busy. cemeteries. Right. And, and, and they're out in the streets promoting their shows, doing street theatre. And it's just, it's an extraordinary thing. The centre of the city so, is shut down to cars. Yeah. And just about every theatre, there's about 300 theatres showing these shows in slots, in, in hour to two hour slots from nine till, till 1 a.m., And they're almost all in walking distance. So if you're sitting at a show and you're going, well, this is rubbish, you can get up, walk outside, get your, you know, your schedule and go, okay, there's another one there. We can be there in 10. So so it's, it is wonderful. Also, the food's really good. (laughs) As a Scott, I thank you for that. And it's, it's currently scheduled. You're a Scott now? I've always Can I just say great Scott then? Um, I thought you were from Newcastle. I thought you were uh, uh, a Herfordshire. Dude, I'm from Oxford. My mother, who is half my genetics, is as Scottish as a person can be who is born in Rangoon. Um, <laughs> she is, I mean, she, is, she, is, she was a daughter of empire. Her father was a major in the Scots Guards. Ah. Um, so she was born and raised in the Far East between the wars and then sent home for that traditional teenage miserable education where for, you know, she didn't see her parents for years on end and had to stay with school friends during the holidays and so forth. She was so Scottish. I, sp- I have spent considerable portions of my life asserting that I am Scottish, not English, despite having been born in England, raised in England, having an English accent, etc., etc. <laughs> well, now I know you truly are an amazing man. Uh, from knowing you, but now I know you're even more amazing. Oh, hush. We're here to talk about Carol. Come on. Well, we're here to talk about things like the Edinburgh Fridge Festival, which you as a native Scot, I hope to uh, go and and have you with me, and then we can get drunk in bars and thrown out of pubs for eating pub food in horrible accents. That's my part. (laughs) Come in in August 2022, John. Come in August 2022. It's a musical. I will make it a goal. I want to throw, uh, to roll it back to the original topic on this. And sorry, although I still want to go to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival desperately. You come this too. Is, this is whole idea of, of telling the stories of the older. This is something that even my mom, my mom is an illustrator, not a writer, she says, but she collects stories as well. She's collected them from all over the world, from Australia, from Israel, from Greece and other places and saying these are stories, snippets of the life that you can give to grandchildren. So I think there's a real value in it of the, the passing down two generations to see. My, my family does it verbally at funerals, but I love the written word part. It, it is traditional. I mean, in, in the Middle Ages and stuff, uh, people used to write letters to their children because, you know, death was always closer in those days. Yeah. And they used to write letters to their children about how they should live their lives. And that's why I called it Letters to My Grandchildren, is because it's out of that tradition. Right. Um, have, you, have you distilled this into a, a published text, a book as well as a movie? No, it's just a film at this point. Okay. Uh, do you have any plans to do that? No, because I hadn't thought to transcribe what they said. That wasn't the agreement. Right. So I have to think about that. Bye. There is a book called uh, Letters to Your Grandchildren, and it's actually a workbook to help you write letters to your grandchildren, <laughs> which is why I initially asked, were, were those related, since I didn't see your name on it. Ah. But uh, uh, the tying it to the medieval tradition, fascinating. Well, there were, there were traditionally, there were often like an older person would marry a young, a younger person. The younger person would be expected to take over the business when they died and then would marry a younger person who would then, you know, from man to woman to man to woman. So they had, you know, essentially line marriages in some of these medieval trade houses and then, you know, pass down this information so that the business and the family would be kept intact. I was just thinking that it's also a beautiful thing that everybody out there, if you have kids, maybe start writing stories down now. You know, even if you think you can't write, write the stories, because what if you have Alzheimer's in your family or you have you tend to die off before your grandkids hit in a certain age because whatever. 
there's no way to pass on these. I mean, once you're gone, don't take all your stories with you. Stories are stories are what connect us to our past and to our future and help us empathize with sometimes the very rough choices our parents had to make. Yeah, I, I still wish I had persuaded my mother to record the stories that she had from her from yeah I mean a childhood in Singapore and Kuala Lumpur in the 1920s oh my um, it would have been fascinating and I just I didn't and I wish I had wow yeah um, if, if you have someone in your in, whom you love who is older or even not older point a camera at them I mean the the, the thing about nowadays is it used to be you could be a movie maker if you had a lot of money because the camera cost two hundred fifty thousand dollars. But yes. since in in this century, you know the the camera that you have in your phone is a better camera than most movies were made on up until the nineteen seventies. Mm-hmm. So you have in your hand a really good movie camera pointed at the people you love and say, "Hey, tell me something cool." My grandfather was a POW in Germany in World War Two, wow. and they escaped and went across the border and finally got, you know, sur- surrendered themselves in Poland and then found their way back out. But it was a story that he never, never told until mom kept nagging him. And when I finally read it, I'm like, this is gold. These could be parts of a movie. because mm. Just the interesting stories of, okay, walking down on the same patrol every day. And they were the paratroopers the night before D-Day that dropped in and 75% of them got captured, so very high rates. But it's all the interesting stories of being hungry all the time, never liking the smell of cooking cabbage because that was all they got to eat. The magic day that mushrooms grew in the prison yard. Wow. <laughs> and how they picked them. And they're, they're just, when you think about it, these are the fun stories that people are carrying along and don't say anything about unless you have a particularly voluble relative. I think they're interesting stories that make it more realistic than... Sometimes I've seen stories that come out of Hollywood, let's just say, that are not as well researched or, or uh, take. <laughs> I'm being polite. You are. You are. Usually. Or, you know, somebody, somebody let me read something once and I shared it with a, a German friend and a Russian friend. And they're both like, this person did not research enough. This is, this is all wrong, which would fool a Hollywood audience. But would it fool somebody that grew up in Germany or grew up in Russia? Or would it make them angry the same way if, if I said, I pulled out my Glock and thumbed off the safety and pulled two rounds and somebody would say, Glocks don't have safety, Jeannie. You completely threw me out of this story. Right. So That's these a very are original... American view. <laughs> yeah, right? Oh, Americans. <laughs> Sigh. But these stories that our relatives had that, especially from around the world and living in different places, maybe why they came to America, maybe what they experienced, maybe the things that they saw that they wished they'd said something, but that was 60 years ago and you didn't say yeah. anything then. Yeah, um, my, my grandfather, my mother's father, um, as I say, he was major in the Scots Guards, stationed out in the Far East. Um, he was there at the fall of Singapore. And he spent the last years of the war in Changi Jail, which is a legendarily awful place. And, and half his cohort died. And you know, I know nothing about his time there. He, he, he didn't leave the stories. And he died when I was five or six. So I never got to ask him. Oh, shame. Yeah, um, yeah these, these, these stories that get lost... It's 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 really sad and it's it's detrimental. It's not just glory. It's that it's that he had this experience, this incredibly yes. dramatic, appalling experience, and to listen to it, to ha- to record it, it makes it more valuable. It makes yes. it by sharing it, it makes it part of the human experience, not just your own. It makes it less lonely. Yes, it becomes. I mean, it becomes part of the great human archive. Exactly. And and the richer and deeper that is. The more useful it is, the the, you know, the more future generations will gain from it. Yes, and it needs to not just be the acceptable stories, the way we're supposed oh. to look at things, as in as Hollywood collates, because you know those become more and more narrow as as things go down. Because this is the way we tell that story, so we always have to tell it that way. We need the outliers in order to fill in the details, and and we need the emotions to understand the way society's changed. One of the things. I mean, so many things have changed so much, but talking to someone about something simple as, uh, and this came up in an earlier conversation, the fact that we wash our cups in between uses is relatively new. It used to be that you just 
keep reusing the cups because doing dishes is more difficult. And before that, you didn't care whose cup you grabbed until the big tuberculosis propagandas where they said, hey, look, stop using each other's cups. That's how you all get sick. People didn't care. They didn't know. Right. Um, um, that carries on a bit. Um, Tony Benn, legendarily. Are oh, you know Tony Benn? No, help me out. Who's Tony Benn? Okay. Anthony Wedgwood Benn, a pillar of the British establishment, changed his name to Tony Benn, became a pillar of the radical left Labour political wing and, and was, was a magnificent and splendid voice for socialism all through my political life until he died. Um, but he was, a, he was a great tea drinker. He had a one-point mug. Um, that's a British pint, thank you. <laughs> um, and he used it constantly. And he was legendarily furious the time his cleaning lady took it and scrubbed it out and removed all the delicious layers of tannin that had built oh, on it. Oh, it must have been dark brown inside. Yes. yes. I exactly. feel so much better for using the same cup all day without washing it off as they switch between tea and coffee. Yes. Yes. <laughs> this is our role here to make you feel better. Jean. I'm practically a vicomte. <laughs> yes, but you're not pouring wine in it in between is the thing. But anyway. Not so far as you know from my work job, no. <laughs> Although there's a few meetings that, you know. So anyway, going back to the lived experience, uh, that is a fascinating piece of advice, Carol. And I really like it. I was very fortunate in that when my mother went to graduate school, part of her credit was doing an essay on her life history. And as I was her computer support and also her proofreader, I got to proofread and edit it and learned quite a lot that I hadn't known that she simply took for granted. Huh. That, uh, for instance, that, uh, and things that most people don't, that everyone here will remember, but she was unable to get a credit card until, uh, frankly, after the divorce in the 70s. And even then it was tough. She had no credit history because women didn't get credit cards before the late 70s. It just wasn't done. 1974. Yep. Yeah. My mom was the first woman who got a, a, a Sears credit card in her own name and how she fight, well, fought for that. She wanted to buy a rug for a hundred dollars and they finally let her have a credit card, but she paid off at $10 a month for a year or for 10 months. Well, but but I mean, seriously, the first in the country. Yep. That's, that's what she told me. Fabulous. She told me she, she yeah. fought with them and fought with them, and she got. She said she got the first one. Yay! Here's card. Well done, her. I was just pondering how a perspective on a story changes. For instance, for those of us that were forced to read the family life of Ralph Jocelyn, so an 18th century farmer. Who? Family life of Ralph Jocelyn, some okay. English bloke. Can hardly remember really? him. I've oh, yeah. never heard of this. Would it have been Rafe then instead of Ralph if he's that early? No, it was the family life of Ralph Jocelyn. Okay, carry on. J-O-S-S-E-L-I-N. You can go look him up. I think it was written Good. by Alan McFarlane. Okay. But it was his daily account. And it's a primary source that we got to use in our history, you know, British history which took a lot of presumptions and turned them on its ear because we look now and we say, oh, girls, you know, they just, they got married young, right? Like, well, not peasants. On a farm, a girl is a worker. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm sure you can relate, you know, that's the people have children because they make wonderful slaves, you know, for now and then take things over later, as it were, in an unpaid labor sort of way. And it, it just shook out a lot of my perspective of what things were like for the non-royals because sure at a royal might be predestined oh yes you're betrothed to this person at age five and you're going to do this when you're 16 years old and you know that the infanta queen and all this real people had it differently but he wrote these things as they happened he wrote about when his child died and when that child died and the other child died and boy was life hard on children i wondered as i was reading it if he had been an 80 year old man writing his memoirs, how he would have had a different perspective of what it was like 80 years before. And do we have that a lot now? Because right now I would say, and it's amazing that your mom was the first one to get his Sears card. Whereas in the seventies, would she have thought to write that down as being remarkable? Do you know what is remarkable as it happens? It's an interesting question for am I writing an autobiography versus a biography later with the lens of history upon it? 
Because I guess what we think of as important changes as the years change. And yeah, I, yeah, I don't think she would have ever thought of that again. She just have to mention it in passing. It's like, what a pain in the ass that was. I had to do all of this stuff. I wonder if any of the things that we're thinking now of my gosh, this is a pain in the ass. And 20 years from now, kids will be, really? You had to do that? <laughs> that was your footprint in the mud. Yeah, it was your footprint in the mud. Exactly. So I'm, I'm wondering what stories are going to come out of the past year. I was wondering, I've been wondering how humanity is going to change because this is the first time humanity has all had a shared experience. And it's been more about the people on the ground than the people in the towers, so to speak. It's been more about how it affects people who still have to work, people who, you know, than the ones who went off to their islands. Yeah. So I'm looking to see a sea change. I got to hear Margaret Mead speak when I was about 11. And she said that after the bomb fell, she predicted that the generation that grew up after that were going to see the world in a different way because they were going to understand that the world could be destroyed. And she said that when the 60s happened, which actually happened in the late 60s, early 70s, that was exactly what she expected, that there would be a generational change. So I'm wondering what kind of change this is going to cause, because for the first time in the history of the world, all of humans have had a shared experience. There's been a couple of them when they look at the dramatic surge of climate change and weather change and patterns and good God, spider migrations in Australia scares the crap out of me and combining that with the plague. Is like, that, I, that, don't go to the Central Valley certain weeks. I'll, well, I won't clue you into one because it'll freak you out because we have those migrations here too just not quite as bad right now. I'm not leaving the house again for another week. That's it. Yeah, you're safe now. But moving on from that. Are you talking about tarantulas? No, no. Uh, ballooning spiders. The, they throw the threads up. Oh, okay. It's a lot more prevalent, actually, in Sacramento Valley, not San Joaquin. And especially right after the rice fields, start, they start burning them in the spring because that's when all the young spiders are like, oh, got to go. Hey, look, updraft. Yay. <laughs> And the look air gets. Time. You look at the time. I could be somewhere else. I we, am somewhere we, else. We have the tra- tarantula migration up here in October. Um, tarantula season is October when the males go out looking for the females and they're walking in a straight line. Wherever they are, they're walking in a straight line down, you know, upwind to find those that those girls. So, but they are adorable. I think they're they're like they don't Romans. bother anybody. They don't bother anybody. The Romans, they 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 go in straight lines. <laughs> So, so what if the girl spiders don't actually find any boy spiders that they want to bite the heads off of? I mean, uh, uh, tarantulas, I don't think practice don't, that, but that's another. They don't, they don't bite heads. They just make babies. Hey. Then they'd better work on their pheromone production, huh? <laughs> you know, we were just discussing this morning over the first cup of coffee, the topic of all of the sharks, the great white sharks, the North Atlantic and the women out there. They're like, you know, I'm kind of feeling romantic. I'm going to go down to the Caribbean, find me a Latin lover in warmer (laughs) waters. If they don't find a mate that they like down in the warm waters of the Caribbean area or the South Atlantic, they just go back up to the North Atlantic and have a baby anyway. What? It's always a girl because, you know, you have to have a boy to make a boy. Oh, for goodness sake. I thought that was a delightful sort of like, I've decided that I don't really want you following me around after all. Never mind, you are not required. (laughs) Wow. Well, you've made my day. That blew me away. Thank you. Fun shark facts. (laughs) Fun shark facts. facts. How did we get from the stories of our grandparents to all these these dangerous animals? Oh, wait. Story. Okay. No, that all fits. Call it the change of new information. What did we not know 20 years ago that affected why we did things and how we did things? I was trying to explain to somebody as patiently as I could that the jokes that we told when we were children of the 70s, 60s, whenever there we were children, are not good jokes to tell anymore. They are all punching down jokes, or many of them are punching, except for the dead baby jokes. And you don't make dead baby jokes around women that have miscarried. Sorry, women out there who have miscarried. But we had a different sense of humor then. And that colors stories too, of the stories that I would have told and written down now. I look back, I'm like, oh my God, I did that. I chanted that. I yelled that. What a horrible little person I was, but I didn't know that I was a horrible person. It was just what we found funny now versus a story of 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. I guess what we're looking at is a change of empathy, where we empathize Mm -hmm. with everyone now instead of just our own kind. And that might be a thing that the internet has had a major contribution to. Good point. 
I heard somebody that was an officer or had been an officer say basic training was harder now because once upon a time you could tell a kid that over there is the enemy. But in this modern age, this, you know, 17, 18 year old boy is aware that his best friend might be a 50 year old boy in North Korea that he plays Mm -hmm. on battle net with. Yep. Like, what do you mean? He's not evil. Well, he's North Korean. Like, yeah, but I play with him all the time. And people are finally also starting to separate governments from their populations, too. For instance, people who read Solzhenitsyn and some of the other writings of you know, Russia, you know, you had this idea of Russia is always this. But now we have many friends from Russia and people that have moved away from Russia. Like, they're just folks, too. They just some folk. of them had horrible childhoods, but they're just folk. And that's what I think that the internet has done. And hopefully out of this time of shared conflict and shared catastrophe, shared catastrophe of monumental proportions. I like that we might call this next one, the age of empathy. Oh, nice. Very nice. On the other hand, I mean, you look at American politics and the rapid divisions and that's happened online as well. There has been deliberate marketing in uh, many different countries trying to stir up nationalism and division yep sure. it's just you know i'm in america these days and and this is the one that i see well i think you you may see more of that because the way to control the people on the ground is to have them at each other's throats mm-hmm. if yeah. they're at each other's throats they won't look up the age of empathy will not happen if we leave control of the media in the hands of those who have it at the moment because they can prevent it who is your favorite media mogul of propaganda in history because I've got a favorite first one that created nationalism before there was ever any nationalism, I think. Stop talking about the yellow papers. No, I'm talking about Guillaume de Nogaret. And he lived at the end of the 13th century, beginning of the 14th. He was the statesman, keeper of the seal, Philip IV of France. He invented France Mm -hmm. because at once upon a time, France was the Isle of Ile de France, which was this cute little island in the middle of the Seine River, because everything else were the provinces, you know, the Aquitaine, the this, that. The counties and baronies, the counties and and dukedoms and baronies, yes. He was the first one to say, no, we are all one. We are all French. And when they needed to be anti-Templar, he created an enemy. Like them, they are the others. They are the Urshers. They are the ones charging you taxes. (laughs) So literally, the, the tax problem's been around for a while. Huh. Propaganda huh. works. Propaganda works. Well stated. So what are your, did you love this kind of project? Uh, do you, how would you recommend somebody get started with it if they wanted to create this for their own family or for somebody else? Where did you first begin? With filmmaking? With biographical snapshots. Well, the thing is, I mean, when we went into the filming business, we needed a camera. But now you don't. You've got one. It's on your phone. So I would say anybody who wants to start recording the stories of the people they love, get out your phone, turn it sideways. Do not have it up and down. Turn it sideways. Because we look at film from left to right. We don't look at it up and down. So turn it sideways and record your friends and, and record the cool things your friends know. And I don't know that there's a human being on this planet who doesn't know something interesting or fascinating or marvelous. So ask them. I love I love the turn it sideways advice because you know, we are vertical people and the instinct is to frame us vertically. But yeah, you're absolutely right. We, we read left to right. It is. I mean, look yeah. at TikTok. <laughs> Every time somebody shows a TikTok video, it's always vertical, isn't it? Right. Dear TikToker tumblers out there, turn your phone. Well, it's because the phone is oriented that way. When you open your phone, it's oriented that way. So you you don't think of now it's a camera, turn it sideways. You know, when it's a camera, turn it sideways. I mean, how many videos have you watched where you're trying to look at what's in the left and you're cut off off, or left or right, you know? And are you going to, are you going to proceed with this? Do you want to do more of them or is this an achievement? Go on to your next project. Actually, I wouldn't mind doing some more. 
I wouldn't mind doing some more um, and getting some more diverse voices in it. I mean, once I moved to up to this mountain, the numbers of people I could access are mostly white. So I'd love to open it up to some more diverse voices and maybe do another cut. So that that's what I'm, I'm thinking at this point. That would be amazing. It would make it a more interesting movie. Well, we will put links to your movies and links to the podcast and other interesting things that we mentioned on today's webcast on our website, which is www.writersdrinkingcoffee.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. We love email. Carol loves to answer email. So you've been listening to Writers Drinking Coffee, a labor of love and enthusiasm put together by the hosts. Our main web support magic is brought to you by Deirdre Schween, and our sound engineer is David Welsh. Our intro music is Pretty Made Milking a Cow, and our exit music is Breakfast with the Morning Person, both by Michael Lindberg. You can hear more from Michael Linger on manyhatsmusic.com. Our sponsors are Art, Coffee, Chocolate, Rum, and Delicious, Delicious Lamb, especially Carol's Lambs. They're delicious. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us today, Carol. Thank you very much. This has been wonderful. And for everybody out there, thanks so much for listening. Thank you.